Hello and welcome. We're delighted today to have John Swinney with us here in the studio. As well as being MSP for Perthshire North, John is also the Cabinet Secretary for Finance, Employment and Sustainable Growth in the Scottish Parliament. John, welcome to Perthshire Online TV. Thanks, so we've got a, a busy a busy schedule every week between um, the, the role as the, the, the Perthshire North MSP and your um, parliamentary portfolio as well. How's life treating you in Holyrood at the moment? It's pretty frantic because it's always a blend every single week between mm. a visiting different events in my own constituency and mm. making sure that I deal with constituents' issues uh, promptly and effectively and then making sure that the government business is attended to properly and of course there's never a straightforward week so there's always something that happens that has to be attended to that's out of the ordinary but uh, it's, a, it's a tremendous privilege to be able to do what I'm doing in, the, in combining my local representative work with being able to serve Scotland as a government mm. minister. Well, it's a privilege for you, for us having you here today as well, and thank you for your time for cool. visiting the studio. Um, John, if we if we talk through some some specific um, subject matter at this point in time that, that's quite high in the agenda, public spending in Scotland, um, especially and in the UK, obviously we've got cost cutting exercises going on. The um, the government also looked at uh, an eight point agenda with regards re re um, directing resource spending into capital investment projects as well. Can you cover where we are and some of the agendas around those? Back in September, the I set out for for Scotland the three years of the spending review for uh, for the next three financial years. That's to cover all of public mm -hmm. services within Scotland, and the objective of that was to recognise that um, we face a reduction in our budget from the UK government. Um, our budget uh, will go down by about twelve percent in real terms over a four year period. That's a big reduction in public spending, so I've got to manage that carefully mm -hmm. to do a number of things. Firstly, to support economic recovery because we've got to get uh, more dynamism into the economy, mm -hmm. creating more jobs, so I took decisions to boost capital expenditure, particularly in relation to infrastructure projects mm -hmm. in Scotland. And then secondly, we've got to make sure that our, our, our people have got the skills and the talents to mm -hmm. enable them to compete in the labour market. We've got a better labour market in Scotland than the rest of the UK, but we still have to invest persistently in supporting right. the development of the Scottish economy. So it's been a, a budget designed to support economic recovery and to protect the public services mm -hmm. upon which the public depend. I mean, one, one of the, the, the interesting areas I saw on that agenda was around what was it, around 125,000 positions with regards to the modern apprenticeship, which yeah. which is very innovative moving forward as well, because one immediately thinks of apprenticeships from years ago, but there's quite a different quite a different tact on that now, isn't there? Very much so. The modern apprenticeship programme has been hugely successful. When we came into government in 2007, there were 15,000 modern apprenticeships a year in Scotland. We've taken that up to 25,000, so it creates many, many more opportunities mm -hmm for young people, but it also makes sure that um, employers are closely connected to the training of young people within Scotland. So the modern apprenticeship has really created great opportunities for young people, but I think employers are also feeling very much strengthened by mm -hmm. what's on offer and what they can, uh, what they can deliver. Um, as a consequence of the investment that's been made, and and um, you know from a from a different perspective of not being an employee, but actually in your own setting up your own business, there's quite a UK focus on the sort of startup um, Scotland and startup Britain focus. New business startups, where, where's that on the agenda at this point? One of the things that we've done, um, we did it back in 2008, and we've sustained it, has been to reduce business rates for small companies. So mm -hmm. when somebody's thinking about coming into mm -hmm. business, and if they're just starting a small company. Um, one of the things that they wouldn't have to think about is paying business rates because the Scottish Government has essentially, for um, about 85,000 businesses in Scotland, we've either abolished or reduced their business rates for small companies. Uh, so that's a big help for companies. Mm -hmm. The other thing we've done, uh, which is a response to a suggestion from the Federation of Small Business, is to put in place a programme where employers are given support to take on new staff. You know, for small companies, taking on an extra member yeah. of staff might just feel like a bridge too far. Yeah. Yeah. But what um, this programme does is give the advice and support, which takes away quite a lot of the complications that uh, would, would ordinarily put an employer off taking on mm -hmm. a further employee. 
Great. Well, ne next topic is, um, which is quite hot and, and generally Scottish independence. Um, there's been a number of polls um, recently, and I think some of the, the statistics have got have moved somewhat with regards of a third option, not just a yes or no, but the Devomax option as well. Would you like to give some background as to what that's about, and how has that actually changed the the, the view on what the, um, the the support of Scottish independence is at this point? Back in in May, the government said that we would have a referendum um, during our parliamentary term, who would ask people if they wanted Scotland to become an independent country, and that's precisely what we will do. Mm -hmm. uh, there will be a yes or no question as to whether Scotland wants to become independent, and that's uh, entirely proper for, for Scotland to, under, uh, to undertake that proposition. Mm -hmm. um, and of course that uh, approach was supported by a huge number of people in the election. The SNP polled 46% of the vote in the election. We've got an overall majority in Parliament, so people were mm -hmm. very crystal clear they were quite happy for this to be um, for this question to be asked. Mm -hmm. Now, there's also an element of debate which says, well, you know, we want to have a stronger range of powers for the Scottish Parliament, but we want to do that within the United Kingdom. And we've made it clear that if people want to come forward with that proposition, we would certainly um, make it possible for that to be asked of the people. But folks should be in no doubt that the SNP government will ask the public do they want Scotland to become independent? And fundamentally, this is a decision for the people. And yes, there's polls that tell us one thing one week and a different thing the next week. I'm very clear there's a strong body of opinion in Scotland that wants our country to become independent. And the right and proper place to determine that is in the referendum. Yeah, completely. And and if you look at the if you take the um the, the want out of the equation and you actually look at it from a business perspective and a medium to long term business model is is there a sustainable business model for Scotland being independent? We, we, we rely very heavily on the oil sector, we see that as being the, the jewel in the crown but that's one industry sector and you, you can't rely on that. Yeah. If you look at the, um, the official statistics that are set out about all of this, mm -hmm. they demonstrate that Scotland contributes more to the UK than we get back in return. Mm -hmm. And even in these very difficult times for public expenditure, um, in four out of the last five years, Scotland has actually been in surplus when the UK has been in deficit for all of these times. So Scotland's public finances, our ability to be an independent country, is absolutely crystal clear to me that that is the case. The question is whether people want to do that. And the arguments for becoming independent are that it would enable us to use all of the powers that many other countries take for granted to invest in our economy and to put our economy mm. at a competitive advantage and to allow us to take decisions that would strengthen Scotland, strengthen our economy and strengthen our communities. And that's the choice that people will face. And, um, you know, typically there's a, we've, we've got lots of talent that comes from Scotland, but unfortunately that talent disappears south of the border or even internationally. Do you feel that there is a sustainable talent of level in Scotland to actually um, execute that business model moving forward. Yeah, I think, I think Scotland's a talented country, but, but you're absolutely right, Gavin. You know, wherever I go around the world, I keep on encountering um, Scots who are running mm -hmm. major operations in different parts of the world. So part of what I think independence will do is create an energy within the country to mm -hmm. excite and retain people to stay here and to make their contribution to making Scotland a more successful country. And that's what independence is all yeah. about. So process and timeline moving forward, what are, the, what are the general steps as we move forward to that decision making process and is there, a, is there an agreed timeline around that? We said in the election that we would have the independence referendum in the second half of this parliamentary right. term mm -hmm. and, and that's what we'll do. I, I think it's important that when politicians make commitments to the public in the election, they stick to them. And that's what we're doing. And okay, there's all sorts of pressure for us to have the referendum earlier. I think we should just stick to the time scale we told people would be the case. I think that's the right thing to do. Um, there'll have to be a bill that goes through Parliament to, mm -hmm. to enable a referendum to take place. There'll be full consultation around about that bill. The Parliament requires us to uh, undertake very full and comprehensive co uh, consultation. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what we'll do. Great. Let's move on to 3rd of May next year. It's the um, local elections, 3rd of May across all 32 Scottish local authorities. And there's a few changes happening next year, isn't there? Well, in the elections in May, this will be the first time since 1995 that the local authority elections will have taken mm. place on their own. You know, yep. And all the other elections since then, they've taken place on the same day as the Scottish Parliament elections. So the local authority elections have been a wee bit um, eclipsed by the parliamentary debate. Um, this is an opportunity for us really to focus on uh, local service delivery and on the priorities for local communities. And 
the one of the, the good things, certainly from my perspective here in Perth and Kinross, is that we have an SNP-led administration here, led in Perth and Kinross by Councillor Ian Miller, who's the councillor up in uh, the area where I live, in, uh, in the Burlington area. Ian principally represents uh, Ayleth. Um, council's really well led. It's a good functioning local authority. It's an efficient local authority. It delivers good quality public services. And in many of the assessments about the performance of the council done by external parties um, in the education service uh, and in child protection, the council's delivering an outstanding service. So we've got a good record to stand on. Mm -hmm. uh, we've also got some of the measures that we've taken forward as a joint partnership between national government and local government. For example, the freeze in the council tax, which has taken away so much pressure on household income over the years. So we've got a strong record to to stand on and we'll set that out to the public in May. Great. And we've got some other changes as well from a technology perspective. And I believe that Perth was actually um, a pilot back in August on, on the new technology platform for the vote count yeah. application. The election system is exactly the same, that mm -hmm. uh, people will have to rank the candidates they want to support, mm -hmm. you know, one, two, three or whatever. Um, but obviously that needs technology to count it. If you do it manually, it takes forever to do that. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the, the new technology was there was difficulty with that technology back in 2007. The new technology was piloted in a by-election in Highland Perthshire where um, uh, the SNP held the seat. It did fantastically well uh, with the election of Councillor Mike Williamson uh, up in the Highland Perthshire ward. Um, and the technology worked really well. So we'll hopefully have a, a swift and efficient count of the Correct. votes when it happens. So in wrapping up, John, um, looking at Perth, what, what do you see? We've got city status um, hopefully pending next year. We've got award-winning events in, in Highland Perthshire and, and Perthshire generally. What do you see as the vision moving forward and the prospects for Perth generally? Perthshire? I think Perth and, I, Perth and Perthshire are in a great place just now. You know, we've got um, an exciting agenda, which again the Council has led on in partnership with many others to try to acquire city status and we remain very optimistic that that will be delivered for the city. The county um, and certainly the northern part of the county that I represent is a very exciting place. There's lots of different ventures. Um, just in the last few weeks we've had the Perthshire Amber Festival that's mm -hmm. been taken forward by Dougie McLean, one of Scotland's greatest traditional yeah, musicians. Yeah. It's brought thousands and thousands of people into the mm -hmm. county. Um, I was up the other week there and I noticed they've just started doing nighttime jumps from the the uh, the bungee platform yeah, at the Gary Bridge. Bungee, yeah. um, it looks great, mm -hmm. but it's something I don't know if I could ever bring uh, myself well, to do. Well, believe it or not, I've actually I've I've um, put my put my name down and Have said, I'm, well, I admitted on air, I think, um, well, recently that I'm going to do a sponsor I jump next I, year. I, 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 when, I, when I inaugurated this a few months ago, I said, um, you should never say never, but yeah. it feels like <laughs> never in this case. Um, and there's a whole variety of different ventures. We've got great strength in this area in food produce. Uh, we've got lots of local producers um, uh, finding outlets for the produce. Um, you know, if you look at the, the farm shop in Blair Gowrie, um, there's a great range of local mm. produce made available there. All sorts of different ventures. So I think we've got great prospects. Yes, there are economic challenges, but we've got to look forward. We've got a strong tourism industry, we've got a strong leisure and recreation industry, we've got a strong food and drink industry, and many good opportunities to build on. And obviously, being the only Scottish town I am applying for the, the city status, there'll be strong um, Holyrood backing for us as well. Well, it's fingers crossed on that. The First Minister has given very clear backing to the city status campaign from Perth. Um, it's been supported by all parties within uh, the Scottish Parliament and uh, we're doing everything we can to try to ensure that Perth uh, is awarded city status. We've got our fingers crossed, um, but I can assure uh, your viewers that um, we're doing everything we possibly can do to make sure that we pull this one off. Great. Well, John, thank you very much indeed for your time My today. Pleasure. Thanks for visiting Perth on Online TV, and we hope that you'll be able to, to pop into the studio again sometime soon. Thank you. So, a very busy year ahead, 2012 city status, local elections, um, lots going on and maybe even a bungee jump from me as well, so thank you. Hi and welcome to the show, and today it's Tea for Two. I'm joined here by Nikki Martin, who's one of the owners of Hetty's Tea Room and Outside Catering here in Perthshire. Nikki, welcome to the show. Hi Gav, thanks. 
Well, it's been a really busy 18 months. Let's, been. Uh, let's summarise it. You've opened up a, a Pitlochty tea room. Yes. You've opened up a Perth tea room. Yes. You've launched your own range of hand blended um, teas. That's right. And you've um, opened up an outside catering business as well. That's so right, that's yeah. pretty hard going in 18 very months. Very hard going. Yeah, very hard going. <laughs> busy uh, girls. Good. Um, Hetes, the idea, the inspiration, the name as well. Where, where did this all come about? Well, Claire, who is my business partner, mm -hmm. as you rightly said, is also an old friend of mine. And she and I have talked off and on over the years about doing something jointly, something that we would love, that we could really get our teeth into. Mm -hmm. And Claire had always wanted to replicate her dear old mum's Rannick Station Tea Room, um, right. which, which Eunice okay. ran for many years. Now, Rannick Station Tea Room, you might not know, was voted in the top 20 tea rooms of the world by the Times in about 1985, 1986, somewhere oh, around I there. I didn't realise that at all. Yeah, ah, so um, Claire grew up with a fabulous tea room around her and has always wanted to do something similar. That's when we started chatting. So it's been 18 months since we started talking, definitely. And we were six months pulling together all the ideas, getting the, getting the branding right, making sure that it was exactly as we wanted mm -hmm. it. Um, but the name... The name's very simple. The name is Claire's little girl's name. Ah, so, right, okay. Yeah, Henrietta, or Hetty for short. She's been mm -hmm. Hetz um, since the day she was born. It's all named after her. So it's all kind of in, in the family, to it's, some extent, the name's from there, and, and it's nothing new with the tea room either. To that's some right, that's right. It's very much in the family, and we say it's a family-run business. You know, it's it's named after Hetty. There's mum, there's Auntie Nicky. Um, Claire's brother actually owns the property in Pitlochry that we lease right, from him. Okay. And uh, yeah, everyone everyone gets dragged in to help outside catering jobs. We've all scrubbed floors when we've opened new shops, so it's it's very much Great. in the family. Well, you know, from the from the customer's perspective, it's all about um, the Hetty's experience, isn't it? it because is. it's your yeah. tea and it's your great cakes and things like that. So we've put together a little uh, montage as a as a taster for Hetty's tea, just to give everyone a, a look and feel to it. <laughs>
Hello and welcome to What's On In Persia This Week. Are you sitting comfortable? Good, then I'll begin. Now we're starting with next Saturday and Sunday, which is the 26th and the 27th of November. Now on the Saturday, it starts very early at 9am in the morning. And on the Sunday, 9.30am at the Perth Concert Hall. And what is it, I hear you say? Well, it's the Scottish Youth Brass Band Championships and the Scottish Open Brass Band Championships as well. It's a great weekend of brass band music with around 40 youth bands and 17 senior bands from Scotland. England, England and Northern Ireland will be taking part. Here's the details again. The Scottish Youth and Brass Band and the Scottish Open Brass Band Championships at the Perth Concert Hall. And those are your dates there. Don't forget on the Saturday it starts at 8, 9am in the morning and 9.30 on the Sunday. For your box office there and tickets it's uh, 01738 621031. Now on Monday the 28th of November at the Perth Concert Hall at 8pm we've got Dave Gorman. Now he's the man behind Are You Dave Gorman and the Google Whack Adventure. Now he returns with a brand new show. He's always one of comedy's most innovative thinkers. Now in this show it stretches the performer. For this show he has formed a double act with a projector screen. Hmm. And they would like to show you their PowerPoint presentation. Now Dave Gorman is at the Perth Concert at all on Monday the 28th of November at 8 p.m. Now do you want to be shocked? Do you want to be thrilled? Do you want to be whipped up into excitement? Well if you do, the Circus of Horrors is here. Now on Wednesday the 30th of November at 8pm and they're at the Perth Concert Hall. The Circus of Horrors. Ooh, the show that rocked Britain's Got Talent. Now it's back with an all new draw dropping sensation of a show. Now it's featuring some of the greatest, the most bizarre and the most beautiful circus acts on earth. And they're all powered along by the pulsating devil-driven rock and roll of Dr. Hayes and the Interceptors from Hell. And the Circus of Horrors is at the Perth Theatre, Wednesday the 30th of November at 8pm. Now I just want to remind you as well, it's pantomime time as well and Perth has got a fantastic panto and it's Jack and the Beanstalk. Now it starts on the 9th of December to Saturday the 7th of January and it's at the Perth Theatre as I said. Now it's that traditional fantastic one that everybody loves with a giant in, Jack and the Beanstalk. I was in that once or twice, I played the giant twice, can you believe that? I had these boots on, I was walking on, luckily I never fell, fell over once, but I'll tell you one thing that got the kids though, I used to paint my tongue with green colour in dye colours and that was the best part of the show, the kids loved it, they used to say to them, what was the best part of the show? They said the, the giant's green tongue when I used to go, Bleh! at them. I'm sorry about that if it's put you off your tea. Anyway, Jack and the Beanstalk will be here at the Perth Theatre. Make sure that you book your tickets well in advance now for this fantastic traditional pantomime. Now I want to remind you as well to go and see a fantastic exhibition that's at the uh, Perth Museum and Art Gallery. Now it's celebrating Chinese life here in Perthshire uh, and you can go and see it as well. It's an amazing exhibition and it's, uh, it's called Tai to Tay. Can you see what they've done there? Now it's open now. Go and have a look at it. It's fantastic. Now if you want to find out more information about it, call the museum uh, and that's on 01738 475000. And remember, if you've got any event coming up whether you're a charity or a, a business or anything like that and you want to let us know let everybody else know get in touch with us here at PershireOnline.tv Hi, this is Gavin Syme and welcome to the show. Today we're talking about investments. We're assuming that I'm investing £15,000 and I'm looking to, to take that out of a bank account and make some investment with that. Um, that could be a traditional financial product such as an ISA, it could be something green such as in solar panels, or it could be in precious metals and um, on gold for example. And to discuss this and give us some options and some background, we've got David Watson from the Perth based Financial Planning Union. David's an IFA and Chartered Financial Planner. David, welcome to the show. Thanks, Gavin. So, David, in the current low interest rate environment, where interest is running at circa 5%, what's the options that you're actually discussing with your clients right now? Yeah, well, I think uh, typically the, the first port of call for most people, assuming they've paid off their debts and they've built up some sort of emergency fund, if they've then got additional capital one above that, the first port of call would typically be to use a stocks and shares ISA. Mm -hmm. uh, assuming they've got the capacity for risk for some uh, some element of capital loss. Uh, 
So that, that's stocks and shares ISAs that you're talking about, David, because there are different ISAs, aren't that's there? That's right. There's two different types of ISAs. There's cash ISAs and stocks and shares ISAs. Uh, cash ISAs offer similar rates of return to bank accounts, mm -hmm. which at, at present time, when the retail price index is running at close to 4.5-5%, you're actually losing money in the long run. So by investing in an asset-backed investment, a stocks and shares ISA, mm -hmm. uh, typically you would expect to achieve a better return over at least a minimum of five-year period. And that's the main advantage as to the stocks and shares ISA then? That's, that's the main advantage. You've got the potential for a better return. Uh, and obviously that goes along with the fact that there's no capital gains tax to pay. Ah, on right. And any income tax, is, uh, is, uh, there's no further income tax to pay. But like everything else though, there's always drawbacks with something. So what's the drawbacks in the stocks and shares ISA? Yeah, I, I guess with stocks and shares ISA, the main drawback really is the, the fact that the, because it's such a tax advantageous uh, savings vehicle, the government actually cap how much you can put into it. So at the present mm -hmm. time, it's uh, £10,680 that you can pay into an ISA. So obviously, if you've got 15000 or more to invest, you can't put all of that into an ISA in one tax year. Right, OK. So, yeah. and, what, and typically, what would the return have been on, on something like that over 12 months if, yeah. I'd, if I'd had that investment? Yeah, I mean, over the past 12 months, the, and the funds vary quite substantially, but the best performing fund uh, has actually been a, a Leg Mason Japanese fund, which has done something mm -hmm. like 56%. Right. Uh, but that, that's quite an exceptional return. Uh, although there have been 50 odd funds that have done 10% plus, so there is potential, as you can see, for better than the 3 or 4% that's being offered in a bank. Yeah, definitely. Okay, so if we move on from option one on the, the, the ISA um, products, yeah. and we move on to the, the green option. I've heard lots of things about solar panels, and even locally you, you travel around and you see solar panels on houses, and yeah. I understand that um, yeah. that uh, although it's, it's not a regulated investment, um, there, there's lots of opportunity there for actual revenue generation from some of the legislation that seems to be in place. So have I got this all completely wrong? No, that's absolutely spot on. I mean, essentially, if, if you own your own property, uh, or I guess if you get permission of your landlord, you can install solar panels on your roof, which um, essentially you can generate your own power for your for your property. Mm. Um, what that means is twofold effect. One, the uh, the power can be used to supply your own property, uh, therefore you're saving what you would mm. have otherwise paid to the electricity company. Mm -hmm. And over and above that, um, if you're if you're producing excess en electricity, you can actually get what's called a feed-in tariff from the government, which basically they'll pay you to put money back into the grid. Um, so, and at that present time, they've got a guaranteed uh, rate as to how much they're going to pay for the next I think it's 20 to 25 years. So it is from that point of view, assuming you, you're prepared to tie your capital up and look at the, the long term, it's, uh, it's a good income producing investment. Great. And, and if people don't have a super pro suitable property, what, I mean, how, how do you go about doing something like this? Because I would assume a lot's dependent on the property that you can actually use with regards to panels. Well, things. absolutely. Yeah. I mean, obviously, I guess because it's reliant on the sun, you, typically you need a south facing garden right, and, right. Uh, and obviously don't want the, the, the garden to be blocked by trees or other properties. Mm -hmm. So, but assuming, uh, assuming that's not the case and you don't have a suitable property, there's a few other vehicles, uh, something called Venture Capital Trusts, which are a bit more sophisticated investments. They actually invest in companies that are making profits from the solar, solar industry. Mm -hmm. um, and there's various tax advantages to those. So that's one other way whereby you can, you can sort of uh, jump onto the terms, as it were, of the, the, solar, the solar panels uh, industry is producing at the moment. It's quite avant-garde, this the solar panel side of things. I hadn't heard of all of this before, <laughs> where you're actually not just reducing, potentially reducing your overhead of your utility costs, but there's, there's revenue generation coming from it as well. That's right, yeah, absolutely. So it's, uh, yeah, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's a good one, food for thought just now. I think one thing to say, the government are actually reviewing the feed-in tariffs at present. So there's, uh, I think the next review date is due up in April next year. And at that stage, they might actually reduce the, the feed-in tariff. So it's probably one of these things, if you are seriously considering it, uh, probably the best place to go is probably the, the Energy, Savings, uh, Energy Savings Trust website and uh, try and probably take action before April next year. So it's a case of understand what it is you're doing, make sure it's right for you and kind of get in there sooner rather than later, Absolute, possibly. Absolutely, yeah. Great. So if we move on to the third option, and yep. I, um, we think about precious metals and specifically gold. I mean, t yep. typically I think of movies and I think of um, gold bars and gems sitting in, um, in private safes, which is all completely unrealistic. Yep. How, 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 tell us a little bit about the, the gold investment at this point in time and what, what I should be looking for out there. Yeah. Well, I mean, essentially, uh, gold has been quite popular. Uh, probably the media have, have sort of made a bit more interest in gold in recent times because of the fact we're in a recession 
and a lot of people with going back historically three or four years when Northern Rock had problems, mm -hmm. the, uh, a lot of people were looking for a safe haven for their money and gold historically has always been seen as a safe haven. So people are actually um, buying gold bullion bars basically because it was deemed to be safe. Great. So if, if just as the normal investor, I'm the £15,000 investor here. It yep. all seems very large scale investing in gold. How does, how does the normal investor go about doing yeah. it? Well, that's a good point. There's obviously the practicalities of buying gold bullion bars. Uh, you obviously then have to find a place to, to store them mm. and obviously insure them as well. Because if, if somebody finds out you've got £15,000 worth of gold under your, your living room carpet, under your floorboards or something, then uh, you're obviously a bit more of a high risk. So. Typically, there are other ways of investing in gold. Uh, you can invest in investment funds. Again, in, uh, essentially, they're companies that are uh, investing in gold mining companies and, and other, uh, other precious metals. Mm -hmm. So that's one way. And another way is what's called exchange traded funds, which um, essentially they're a fairly new mechanism in the UK. They've been quite popular in America for, for up to 10 years now. But they essentially try to track the price of gold. Um, and that's, uh, that's probably the two other, the two most common ways to actually invest in gold without physically buying, buying right. the stuff. Fantastic, yeah. great. So I'll, get, I'll, I'll buy the gold and then make sure I get a great <coughs> alarm system fitted with that's powered from the solar panels that, <laughs> that, that, that I've invested in as well, potentially. <laughs> well, absolutely, yeah. <laughs> Listen, David, thanks a lot. That's three great options. So we're talking about more traditional financial products such as the ISAs, we're talking about something green and, and solar energy and solar panels, and we're talking about um, precious metals and gold. So there, there's three great options to, for me to think about for my potential £15,000 investment. David, thank you. That's my pleasure. And goodbye. We're very fortunate in Perthshire that we've got some great events and one of the key events of the calendar is the ETAP Caledonia, which is held in May. We're lucky today that we have Trisha Fox from the organising team here to, to chat with us. Hi, Hi Trisha. Hi Gavin, how are you doing? I'm doing very good, and yourself? Oh fine, F fabulous. So the ETAP Caledonia, um, tell us a little bit about the background. Where, where did, what inspired it and when did it happen and, and give us a bit of a background. Well, it started in 2007 um, in Highland Perthshire and um, the, the organising company approached Perth and Ross Council and basically said that they wanted to run what was then the first um, of the UK's closed road events mm -hmm. um, in the area and Perth and Ross Council said absolutely we'll get behind this and um, they, they closed the roads of Highland Perthshire for a few hours on a Sunday morning. Um, and we had around about a thousand cyclists taking part that first year. A thousand. And how many did you have this year? Uh, we had 5,000 this year, so it's grown um, quite significantly in the last few and, years. And um, for next May, because I know that the, um, the, the, the placements go from, from sort of now onwards, isn't it? They, they register the competitors. They absolutely do. We're actually sold out for next year. You're sold um, out already? Yeah, we sold out. I can give you an exclusive on that. That happened earlier this week, so we're completely sold out for 2012, um, which is amazing. But there's still 5,000 people coming, so we're, we're absolutely at capacity. Now. So a bit like the London Marathon, you're going to have to get your entries in very, very quickly nowadays um, to get, get a place on it. Yes. And last year it sold out in November, so we're two months ahead in terms mm -hmm. of selling out, so it's been absolutely amazing. But um, the, the people actually, they, I mean, I've got friends that actually uh, they compete in it, and the amount of effort and training that goes into it, it it's, it, it's phenomenal to some extent, isn't it? It's 81 miles, and a lot of it's uphill. <laughs> so, yeah, they, they absolutely, you can't just roll up on a bicycle and, and hope for a good Sunday, Sunday cycle. <laughs> you really do have to put some work into it. And um, it's always as a, a charity partner as well, and I think you announced a new one um, for next year's event, is that correct? We sure did. We've, we've just signed a deal with Marie Curie Cancer Care um, for three years and they are our title partner for the event so the money raised by people cycling for Marie Curie um, will go directly to Marie Curie Cancer Care patients in this area which oh, is that's phenomenal. fantastic yep. that's great and um, obviously the, the as well as all the effort the, the romantic Highland Perthshire air brings out the um, the most romantic in some people and I think there was a special event at the starting line or something last there sure this year was. wasn't there? Yeah we, we had um, Joe and Rick Millen who um, tied the knot actually both of them met um, cycling uh, both cycling fanatics, very, very much um, aiming to be in the top 10. But before that, they thought they'd um, tie the knot. So we had a minister on the start line at 6 a.m. in the morning <laughs> and um, the press were gathered round and several thousand cyclists. And uh, we, we watched them take their vows, which was lovely. That's fantastic, isn't it? Yeah. And um, 
What, what's the plans moving forward? You I mean, obviously, it's um, you've won awards for some of the other events and things in, in Highland Perthshire. Good, good plans moving forward? Oh, I think ETAP deserves a few awards. I think I think we'll be going think for so some too. this year, definitely. And and it brings a huge amount to the area. I mean, well, I was going to I was going to touch on that what, because it, I mean, it, it is fantastic that it brings business into the local area. What the, Give us a summary of, from an economic perspective. Well, si- I mean, simply speaking, that one day alone brings in over a million pounds into the local economy. Um, if you try and book a bed in Pit Lochery now for the 13th of the 12th, 13th of May 2012, you will not get one. It's it's that simple. People are, are staying in the surrounding areas in Dunkeld, um, up into Aberfeldy to, to actually get places mm-hmm. to stay. Mm-hmm. So, you know, the, the whole area actually benefits massively from this event. Um, and, and brings a lot of business to the area, and it's and it's not the obvious things as well. The hardware shop on the main street in Pitlochry does its best day of business every year, the day before ETAP, and it's people buying things like camping stoves and puncture repair kits and and so on down the line. So you know, it's it's very very varied. It's just, it's just fantastic because it's amazing. You know, like myself, you're a good social media user, and um, I've had a friend up in Aberdeen who who was training and came down for mm-hmm. it, and it was interesting at the time he Facebook. I think on the Friday or something, going, can somebody recommend a good restaurant in Perth on the Saturday night? <laughs> you know, which is, which is great. Um, so listen, thanks for popping in today and no um, hope all, all the plans go well for um, for next year. Thank and you. if there's any uh, special events that happen on the starting line or the end line, then please um, make sure that Perth Online TV is aware of it. And oh, we'll you'll be, be popping first to know. Good, thank you. And everyone, put the 13th of May next year in the diary if you're a cyclist. That's the date for you in Perthshire.